But I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the mic over to my brother. We're gonna give you a little bit of history about the Florida Folk Festival, and then uh, we'll go from there. I'm Johnny Bullard, and um, have been involved with the Florida Folk Festival for over 40 years. I grew up in White Springs. Jerry Lawrence will tell you our family and Carrie's family have been in the, that area for generations, and so uh, we feel a certain ownership with the Florida Folk Festival. Most of what I'm going to tell you, you could probably find on the website if you wanted to go there. But um, there would be no reason to talk about a Florida Folk Festival nor any other event in the state of Florida had there not been a Swanee River and had Stephen Foster not taken down an atlas and decided to scratch through the word PD and shorten Suwanee, S-U-W-A-N-N-E-E, to two syllables, Swanee, and immortalize the river. Don't ever forget that. Whether you like the song, whether you don't, whether you feel like it should be the state song, or whether you don't, there would be no Florida Folk Festival. There would be no uh, park dedicated to Stephen Foster on the banks of the river up there. There would be no reason. So don't ever lose sight of that. That's the primary reason that the park's there, and that's the reason that we can be celebrating a 60th Florida Folk Festival. But that did happen. And in 1935, a group of people decided to push through the legislature, old folks at home, to become the state song of the state of Florida, and it passed. And then uh, people decided that they needed a, a memorial to Stephen Foster somewhere on the banks of the river now that we have a state song. And so Eli Lilly, who was the pharmaceutical king from up in Indianapolis, Indiana, had a huge collection of Foster memorabilia. And the state of Florida brought him down and he got on a flat boat with Mrs. W.A. Saunders from White Springs and a group of other civic leaders. And up and down the river they went and they decided that they would put it in White Springs there on the banks of the river, the Stephen Foster Memorial it was called then. A uh, hundred acres was procured from three or four families there in the state of Florida who initially transferred title to the Florida Federation of Music Clubs and they held it for a good uh, long while, probably about two or three years, and then title was transferred to the Stephen Foster Memorial Commission, which was an independent commission that answered only to the governor at that particular time. It was not under any umbrella for any Department of State. It was a commission created purely that answered to the governor, and they met on a regular basis there in White Springs. We were lucky enough or very fortunate enough that Mrs. W.A. Saunders, one of her forebears, was Governor Broward. Uh, then there was political connections there all over the state. Fred Cohn was elected governor who had connections in White Springs, and he was followed by Fuller Warren, whose wife's family was from there. In 1952, at the Colonial Hotel in White Springs, which was situated just as you go into the south gate, the gate, gate where you walk, the Saunders family owned it and they held a, na a meeting of the National Federation of Music Clubs and the question was asked, now we have the Stephen Foster Memorial, what kind of musical event do you think would be best for here? And she suggested a folk festival. So the Stephen Foster Memorial Commission engaged Sarah Gertrude Knott, who was the foremost authority at that time in the United States on folk festivals. She was brought in during Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration, New Deal, to promote folk music across the nation. And for the first year, she, for two years of the festival, in 1953 and 54, she came down and she was the MC for it. The first year, she and Miss uh, Cousin Thelma Bolton and Miss Saunders got into a car and traveled all over the state of Florida. And they signed up people to come for the Florida Folk Festival. They tried to find as many diverse cultural groups as they could. And for what they did at that particular time, I feel like they did a good job. They had Menorcans who came from over in St. Augustine. They had the Czechoslovakians who were from down around Masarki Town. They brought in Cubans from Ybor City. They had uh, the Seminole Indians who came down from the Everglades. They had African Americans that performed on the stage and sat right there with white audiences at that particular time, which was a huge step in the segregated South for that particular time. And they really, really made every effort they could to bring in as many people as they could. They did a great job. And so she was there 53, 54, and then she told the commission, I'm, I'm tired of, kind of tired of this, don't want to do it anymore, and you need to look for someone else. So they engaged Thelma Bolton, who was from Gainesville. 
She was the first certified speech teacher in the state of Florida, having studied at Emerson College up in Boston, Massachusetts. And she came down and she had performed at two of the, um, two of the festivals. And so the commission engaged her to be the director. And she came on full time in 1956. They employed her full time that year. The first two festivals were held down where the Ann Thomas Gazebo is now. That's where those festivals were held. They moved bleachers down there and they had the festival down there. Then the Memorial Commission had procured the marble from the old Barnett Bank building over in um, Jacksonville and they had hauled all of this marble in and deposited it up there. So they took the marble and they built the old marble stage and in 1950, 55, 55 was the first year they had a performance at the old marble stage and they had bleachers all the way around the old marble stage and initially the food vendors and the craft vendors were under a tent by the old marble stage and then they built some lack of a better word it was like booths that was out of, that was out of cypress and cypress stakes but that was later on for the food and uh, craft vendors to go into and all of the entertainment was held from up there and she cousin Thelma Bolton was the mistress of ceremonies along with her able assistant for years Barbara Beecham who was from there in White Springs don't ever forget her because she did so much for the festival and they really ran the show up there until the Florida Folklife Council was, I mean the Florida Folklife Program was created by Act of the Legislature in 1976 and they brought the first staff folklorist into White Springs and when I saw the first two roll in at that gatehouse I thought my lord how is this going to jive with what we have here because I'm not, I'm not being, making a disparaging remark, but mm, they kind of looked like remnants of Woodstock coming through the gate, you know, and with what the memorial was at that particular time, with everybody in antebellum dresses and, you know, people neat and pressed and the way Cousin Thelma carried out the folk festival, you didn't perform if you were a female performer unless you wore a skirt unless you had on the proper type of undergarments, including support undergarments, unless you wore shoes that were co covered the top of your foot. If you had your, uh, if you were a man, you wore a shirt and you tucked in that shirt and you wore a belt and all of these were her rules. And let me tell you, if you didn't abide by those, those rules, you would find yourself after about the second song with her saying, let's clap them off of the stage now. And you went, yeah, and then you went into that good night and you never came back. And so that was the way that it worked because she was in control. Now, there was a festival that was held in Dade City that was called the Heart of Florida Festival at that particular time. And uh, that's where she found Dawson's father, Bobby Hicks. That's where she found Jeannie Fitchin. That's where she found a lot of people. That used to be the quote unquote proving ground to see whether or not you were good enough to come up to the Florida Folk Festival. She would make her trip down there. She didn't drive. Barbara drove her when she went, or Carrie's grandmother, Aunt Nancy Morgan, or she took the Greyhound bus. She did not drive. And you did not refer to her at the park in a position whenever she was not on that stage as Cousin Thelma. Cousin Thelma was a name for her, like Minnie Pearl. It was a character, but when you worked with her, it was Miss Bolton. And I can tell you the line was drawn let me go on with the festival though. She took it over and uh, she, she was basically there for over 30 years from 1955 until around 1988 or 89. And then they began to allow people, you know, who were part of the folk life program and other entertainers to come in because her age had reached the point too that she was not able to do as much as she, as she could. And um, she died in 1992 she lived a good long life from 1904 to 1992, so you do the math. And she was a wonderful person, and I think the reason, a lot of the reason the people of the town felt such an ownership in that festival was she immersed herself into the life of the community, and she did things to help promote the community as well as the festival, and she made everyone feel that they were a part of it, and so that was, that was good, and so have the people since then. The Folk Life program was disbanded by the legislature in 1995, 1995. They decided no, no more need for a Folk Life program. So uh, out it went, and then the Department of State still ran the Folk Festival from Tallahassee 
Ken Crawford was hired by San, uh, Secretary Mortham, Sandra Mortham, as the director of the Florida Folk Festival. And the, the Florida Folk Life Council, of which I was a part for five years, made the decisions as to whether you got the yay or the nay to come, and um, along with his advice. And in 2002, Secretary Harris decided that no longer the Department of State need to do that, and so they were out, and uh, after what we thought might be the last festival, she decided that the Department of Environmental Protection, now the Division of Parks, would run the Florida Folk Festival. But it was a very iffy, iffy situation for the 50th, I can tell you. That was a, we didn't know whether there would be a festival or whether there wouldn't. And um, the amphitheater where we are now, was where you perform now for the main stage, was constructed in 1975. And that was the first year that the performers went down and did the folk festival there. And when the folk life program took over, then they had multiple stages. You know, they had the storytelling tent, they had other performance stages, the Azalea stage, and others. So they did create a dimension, and they also created a dimension where, as Jerry Lark said, the state began to look at a theme for the folk festival and kind of build around that theme. So I feel like each group has really added something through the years. and. The, the amazing thing to me is that anything that's involved with the arts, that the state has supported for that long. And so I'm grateful for that. There's legislative language that they put so much a year into the Florida Folk Festival, but you know that could go away at any time. You know, every, nothing, is, uh, nothing is concrete except death and taxes. And so that could go away at one time. I think here in, in Sarasota, where we are, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it right, but was it the Asilo uh, Theater for a long time? Asilo Theater was supported by the state of Florida, and that was the state's official theater, and I don't know whether they give money for it anymore or not, but at one time, the legislature strongly supported it, so I think that might be one of those instances where they backed out over a period of time and didn't. As Jerry Lawrence said, we're fortunate that we have money in private trust, that we can do that, you know, do some work at the Folk Festival, but we hope that it continues you know, that the legislature will, in their wisdom, continue to, to support it. Um, uh, he mentioned that the CSO was formed in 1989, and it was, and it's done a lot of good work since then, and we appreciate their support of it. So that's basically the history of the Florida Folk Festival for you in a nutshell. There have been wonderful performers who have come through the years. There have been... Um, some not so wonderful. There have been people who have brought, been brought on through the years who I can recall, and I will tell you this story before I ring off, the very first performer I ever remember who was brought on by the Florida Folk Life Program at that particular time where they overrode Cousin Thelma and decided we're going to bring this person on even though you don't particularly care for her was Diamond Tooth Mary. She was brought on. Now, I can tell you this story. Backstage, Cousin Thelma told me, she said, they brought that damn contemptible woman up here. I did not agree with her being up here. I don't agree with her being up here. Well, I talked to her enough backstage. I was volunteering. I'd come to really kind of like her. And so I went to her and I said, Mary, you got a rough horse to ride, sweetheart. But I said, I'm going to tell you how I think you can ride it. When you go out on stage, I said, sing Amazing Grace, and on the last verse say, I want to dedicate this to a sweet woman, a good woman, a kind woman, Cousin Thelma Bolton, and I want her to come up on the stage and sing it with me. And I said, put your arm around her, and I said, sing that song, and I said, I believe all will go well. Well, she did just that, and after it was over, Cousin Thelma came to me and she said, you know I was mistaken about her. <laughs> really is, really is. Wonderful. So that's one story I can tell you about her, but she could flat clap you off if she didn't like you, and if she did like you, you would find yourself performing longer. But she was a character, and there have been many characters who have performed there and some who still perform. And I think the beauty of it is it involves, as Jerry Lark said, so many, many areas that perpetuate the culture of this state. Now, let me just tell you, when it first started, that was not the purpose. It was to make money for the Stephen Foster Memorial Commission, pure and simple. It was a money-making thing. It, they, they, they were thinking, how could we make money? And in the byproduct, they created something that I feel like is a beautiful way 
to celebrate the diversity of this state through music, through art, through the perpetuation of a culture of a state that is very diverse. And my one regret through the years is that Florida has never been the host state for the National Folk Festival. I hope at some time in the future, maybe we will be. Other states with not nearly as much to offer, maybe not as much to offer as we have, have been there, and I hope one day the state of Florida will be at the National Folk Festival. That's a dream, but we can all have dreams, as Stephen Foster was, a beautiful dreamer. So we can say that that is a dream. And I thank you for listening to me, and I hope you've learned something. And does anyone have any questions for me? When did you first start performing at the Florida Festival? Uh, I performed the first time. I will tell you, I was in the fifth grade. It was 1968. Uh, 69 and I performed with a fifth grade group and we square danced and did that uh, did the folk dance on the marble stage but now Jerry Lawrence and Carrie he'll talk more about that they were the child prodigies that were brought on when they were really young you know but I did perform there then and back then the school students sold programs and you know and we made so much money out of each program and then we got we took a trip to St. Augustine and would stay overnight that was what, how we made the money for that probably be against the law now but uh, you know but back then we did that and so that was another way that the community was really involved any other questions thank you again I'm going to uh, turn the mic over Carrie Walden and I and Johnny grew up in White Springs and um, of course the festival was like uh, another national uh, national holiday for us there. So uh, I'm gonna get Kerry Walter to talk about a little bit his family, his uh, a pioneer family of that area, and of course Kerry's been involved with the festival for several years. And uh, just a little recollection of some things that he wants to talk about and his grandmother, and his family. Good. Thank you, Jerry. I am Kerry Walter, and I grew up in White Springs on the banks of the Swanee River. And a lot of folks may know my claim to fame, and that's my grandmother, Aunt Nancy Morgan. And uh, she, wonderful pioneer lady uh, from North Florida, grew up that is, and grew up on Tom's Creek on the uh, Florida Georgia line. But her and cousin Thelma were great friends. As Johnny mentioned, cousin Thelma didn't drive, and the only way she got around was the Greyhound bus or from friends. And my grandmother toted cousin Thelma many a mile up and down the East Coast going to folk festivals, listening for talent and trying out new things that they could bring to Stephen Foster. Uh, my grandmother performed at Stephen Foster. She uh, had arts and crafts there for many number of years and then uh, she created corn cob jelly. How many of you ever had corn cob jelly? Uh, gra Grandma had written a cookbook called Aunt Nancy's Country Cooking on the banks of the Swanee River and her corn cob jelly propelled her to fame because she made jelly out of corn cobs and sold them the uh, first time at the Florida Folk Festival and, and sold out on Friday and didn't have enough made for Saturday and Sunday. And uh, she later got into cooking chicken and dumplings and you may have had a good plate of chicken and dumplings. And, and Mama told me the story that they would take a month or so prior to the festival and would cook chickens, pick it off the bone, roll out the flour, make the dough, freeze it, and then they would sell it, cook it by the wash pot full and sell uh, chicken and dumplings, roll and coleslaw for three dollars a plate. That's right. And that's how they made extra money as well as the arts and crafts. Uh, my mother, when she was in the fourth grade, sang on the stone or sang at the, at the stage near the gazebo for the first time and the song that she sang was Mustache on a Cabbage Head that my grandmother had taught her. And I want to fast forward a few number of years. I was almost born at the Florida Folk Festival. Many of you may remember the festival was the first weekend in May and had been for many, many number of years. Then they had a little experiment in the mid-70s where they tried to move it to September, to, I think to control the movement at the time that was, uh, uh, how can I say this in a delicate way, that uh, they didn't want another Woodstock, let's just put it that way. And so they moved it to September that didn't go quite well, so they moved the festival then back to uh, Memorial Day, where it has been ever since. But Grandma was cooking chicken and dumplings at the festival this particular year in, in 1964, 
Now, my mama was pregnant. I'm talking big time pregnant, where she said I was due any day. And then we were cooking chicken and dumplings at the festival, and a, and a flood came up that weekend where it, the water began to lap the bridge, lap the railroad trestle going to Lake City, which is where the hospital was. So on Sunday afternoon, she says, after climbing over a table uh, at the craft booth, realizing she was pregnant, and if they didn't get to Lake City, they're going to be trapped in White Springs. Daddy loaded her up, took her to uh, Lake City to spend the night with my other grandparents, and on Tuesday morning, May the 5th, I was born. So I, I tell the story, I come close to being born at the Florida Folk Festival, and Mother says, now I know why you love it so much. I said, yes, ma'am. I performed when I was in the fourth grade on the old marble stage, and guess what song I sang for the first time? Mustache on a cabbage head was one that I learned from my grandmother down to my mom. And I played the auto harp. And then the next year, Scott, our friend Scott Gay, who lives in White Springs and has recently restored his grandmother's house that was built in the 1920s, and Jerry Lawrence and I were in Miss Mildred Shiver's class. And uh, Jerry Lawrence and I were teacher's pet. We just gonna tell that and it, because whenever they'd come up a bolt of lightning or a thunderstorm, Miss Shiver would get Jerry Lawrence and I out of class to walk to her house, which was right by the hardware store in White Springs, and unplug her TV so the lightning wouldn't get it. <laughs> and uh, I can assure you, it took us a half a day to go unplug that TV. <laughs> but, but we were sort of her favorites, but she taught us how to square dance, and she always had a group that square danced at Stephen Foster on Fridays for the, um, for the park. And we were able to sell programs and raise money for our trip to St. Augustine. Uh, so fourth grade, fifth grade, and then I continued to sing on the stage. Jerry Lawrence and I began to sing together. Johnny began to sing in our group, and you may have heard uh, Bullard Brothers and Friends became known, and we invited other folks to sing with us. Some years we have the same musicians, some years we don't. We, we tend to include a lot of different folks. But I think the highlight of, of my career of singing at, at the Folk Festival was last year when we had the honor of being a main performer on Sunday night on the main stage, on the amphitheater stage. And uh, Jay Lawrence and I, we practiced real hard because we usually don't ever practice, uh, but we practiced real hard. And something about being on that amphitheater out among friends and the weather was perfect, not many mosquitoes, uh, nice little breeze, and knowing that Grandma had uh, passed away last year uh, at the age of 97, uh, so I lost a legend there, but it was something that was just absolutely cataclysmic and, and spiritual that we connected with our heritage. And, and to us, I thought that was one of our, our greatest performances and just really enjoyed being there and performing at the show. Uh, we plan our, our weekends around the Florida Folk Festival. Uh, we've already started planning now uh, for this year's event. Uh, we sort of didn't get to sing in the tower last year, which has been one of our main stage performers because we do a lot of southern, traditional, old-time gospel. And we love being in the tower to do that. And, and we figured the trade-off last year was we got the main stage on Sunday night, so we sort of gave up the tower on Sunday morning for that. But, but we hope to be back in the tower uh, this year because we do a lot of, a lot of gospel. And just an exciting time. Grandmother wrote a book called Out of the Pocket. Uh, which you can buy at the Cousin Thelma Bolton Folk Life area and her cookbook at Nancy's Country Cooking. Uh, it talks about the way she grew up, her life, talks about the folk festival and the things that uh, she's experienced in, in her years of living. And it's a, a great history of a true pioneer woman. And uh, we were talking today co coming down how much we miss those folks. Uh, Cousin Thelma, uh, Aunt Nancy, my grandmother, they don't make them like that anymore. And uh, one thing that Grandma read, had written in the preface of her cookbook was that they made their entertainment. They didn't have cell phones and iPads and iPods and TVs and all these contraptions and devices. She says, we made our entertainment. If we wanted to do something, we had a hog killing or a cane grinding or a syrup pulling. You know what a, a candy pulling or a syrup pulling is? It's where you go and make homemade candy and it begins to pull it. He said, we brought our family and our friends together. We had a square dance. We made our entertainment. And uh, I thought about that. The Florida Folk Festival in its sixth year is a way that we make our entertainment. It's a way that we share our heritage 
and a way that we keep our tradition and our past alive. And uh, just a wonderful experience to be a part of. I love singing with Johnny and, and Jerry Lawrence uh, because our rehearsals, when we do practice, tend to turn out to be more of a love session and just having a great time of fellowship with each other and, and doing what's important in this life. Uh, Jay Lawrence tells a little story he heard a, a minister tell one time who worked at hospice that said, I never once heard a patient tell me that they wished they'd have worked more. They always say, I wished I'd have spent more time with my friends and more time with my family. And I've been getting to learn as I get older how important the folk festival is to me and the fact that I can spend quality, cherished time with those that you do love. And just an honor to be here with you today to talk about our passion, our music, our joy, what we love to do, and the fact that the Florida Folk Festival is the longest running state-sponsored folk festival in the United States. And we have to keep it going. We have to keep it going. And uh, there's too much talent in the state not to showcase it, to give them a venue uh, to express their love of music. A lot of folks say, well, we got too many stages. And I've been one of those. You know, you get the program, there's 12 different stages, and everybody you want to see is on a different stage at the same time. Yeah. And uh, but that's a great outlet to give as many artists an opportunity to express themselves. And uh, it's just a wonderful experience. And we look forward to seeing you folks up here in, in White Springs, Florida, on the banks of the Swanee River uh, for Memorial Day weekend for the 60th Annual Florida Folk Festival. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. How many of you knew my grandmother, Aunt Nancy Morgan? Have you ever had the chance? She was one of the, one of the first recipients of the Florida Folk Heritage Award and, uh, back in the, in, the, uh, in the 80s. And so it was one of the first recipients there. But if you didn't get a chance, go into the craft area. You'll probably see some of her quilts. If you see the Pool of White Springs, she did that. She made that quilt. And you, her books will be there. And just take a gander and look at it. I think you will we'll enjoy some of the stories that... Uh, and some of the tra traditions from the past that she has preserved for us. Again, thanks for letting me be here, and we look forward to seeing y'all at the uh, Florida Folk Festival. Before we move on, Gloria, do you you have a, you said you had the theme for the festival? Uh, yes, uh, it's and, and I have and I had it in here somewhere. Okay. <laughs> It was it was the uh, inland last year last year's festival was the outer panhandle. Out, outer panhandle. This is the inner panhandle. The, the inner panhandle. So that's in West Florida, uh, and and I know we're we're getting ready to and, close and, shop here. So, and, the, and and Friday night the headliner is Billy Dean. <coughs> right, Billy Dean will be on Friday night. Saturday night is Arlo Guthrie, and Sunday night we're going to have John Anderson again. Will be the headliners. Oh. Uh, so we'll we'll have we'll have a good array of headliners there. But let me let me just say one thing before we move on to that. These folks always get a lot of publicity and, and it's just circumstance and their talent that they were in the right place at the right time. But there are so many talented people, uh, performers there at the Florida Folk Festival, and so many people that give of their time and their talents. But one thing that I always try to mention, and again. Uh, Carl will uh, convey this, or anybody that ever does music, Tom, that the people behind the scenes that support this and volunteer their time and their love of the arts are the real stars. They really are. So give yourself a hand for that. If you're one of those folks, thank you again. I want to say a, a, just a tidbit of my take on the festival uh, to give you some memories of the Florida Folk Festival. Growing up there, uh, probably the year, it was in the early 70s, and we had 100,000 people in White Springs, and we had people skinny dipping in the river, which we did that prior to, 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 to the crave. Uh, but it, that was a time that opened my eyes to what else was going on in the world. And then the year I was, I guess I was about six years old, Carrie and I were down at the, in the marble stage uh, where the Colonial Hotel was, and this huge, long black hearse pulled in, and out got this guy. He was a, he was tall, and he had a black hat on. And I said, "Carrie, who is that?" He said, "I don't know." So we walked over, as kids do in awe, and it was Will McLean, and we listened to his songs, 
and then we would we'd start listening to other artists that came down there, the Paul Champions and the Jim Blues, and it changed my life. It changed what I thought about music and started giving me ideas about singing and creating songs. And uh, those folks and Don Grooms, and I could go on and on about those folks, really uh, led the way for me as a young person uh, to start writing music about Florida and about what was going on in our lives in the state that we love so much. And now the thing that I see that we talk about the, the history of the festival, the bright future for me, Mindy, is seeing these young folks that are coming on the scene now. Last year we had a, uh, and we do this at the Will McLean Festival, there's so many young, talented people, the Jubal's Kins and, and those kids that are coming on. I call them kids because I'm getting old. They, there's just numerous artists that are coming on now that are carrying the torch. And that's what we've got to encourage folks. We've got to encourage these folks and hope and pray that they'll continue uh, to, to keep this uh, alive. It needs to be kept alive. If, if there's anything, again, like I said earlier, that we need to encourage is music and the arts to help wound uh, uh, for wounded hearts and minds in this country right now. I think it's a must. I do. And so let's encourage that, encourage each other, and hopefully we'll continue to do the Florida Folk Festival. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Friends of Florida Folk for having us here today and for your kind invitation. We appreciate it so very much and for the opportunity. And as Jerry Lawrence said, you know, when I think about people who needed a reason to go on living or to have hope, I think about the victims who were in concentration camps in Europe. I think about a lot of people. And the one thing that helped so many of them hang on was the thought of a song, a poem, a passage from something they had read. Don't ever underestimate the power of the arts in any shape, form, or fashion. It's the first thing government wants to cut when they cut something, but it's so vitally important. And so I thank you for, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I thank you for your continued support of the Florida Folk Festival and for what it means to the state of Florida. And whether you've been here for several generations like our family has, or whether you've just arrived a short while ago, you tell anybody one who asks you the question about why do you love it so much? If you have a love for the state of Florida, as Bobby Hicks wrote in his song, I'm a Frenchman, I'm an Indian, you know, I'm whatever, opportunity for all men, and you answer them, I'm Florida. Need I say more? And you go on with that. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was a great talk. While we're here today celebrating the 60 years of the Florida Folk Festival, but we're also celebrating 30 years of Friends of Florida Folk. And part of that celebration is a wonderful cake back there for a birthday cake that Miss Goody Haynes prepared. So we're going to take a few minutes.